Hey everybody and welcome back to my channel where today we are going to be wrapping up 2021. We're going to be talking about statistics and the worst books of the year, the disappointments, the surprises, and the best books of the year. Basically, we're going to be talking all about how my reading went in 2021. And we are going to start with some very basic, basic statistics. Starting with how many books did I read? Well, I read 119 books, which is fairly average for me in the last like seven or eight years that I've tracked. I generally read between 100 and 150 books. It is fairly variable because, um, you know, life events, but generally speaking, I do fall in the 100 to 150 range. Interestingly, I had a ton of DNFs. I actually DNFed 44 books this year, which means that I attempted 163 books. So that's my the books I read and the DNFs combined, 163. And I DNFed fully a quarter of them, which is so high. That's so many books. And I had to think about it for a moment, but I realized, honestly, I went really hard on some goals that I had that were all about, you know, reading these books that have been sitting on my shelf for a long time, trying these really old book recommendations, and I didn't necessarily think that I was 100% going to love them all, um, but I still wanted to give them a chance, and it turned out a lot of them just really weren't for me anymore, which was not surprising in the moment, but it did add up to a ton of DNFs for this year. Um, it is, I think, a little bit lower than last year, but I am hoping that for 2021 it is oh, not nearly so high as that. Um, my average rating per book was 3.84 stars and that did feel a little bit low to me and so I did an adjusted average because I do read books that my older child picks out for me and those tend to be books that I do not like. In a, in a lot of cases they are books that I would probably DNF if I were just reading them for myself. And so I pulled all of those out and it did bring my rating up to 3.92 which honestly felt a little bit better. Um, Interestingly, I only read eight books this year that I rated below three stars. And um, of those eight, five were picks from my older child, which again, I, I have not liked a ton of the books that they have picked out, but three of those were from me. So those are on me. Um, but also, as I was thinking about it, I thought, I kept thinking about how it didn't really feel like I loved a ton of things that I read this year. And so I went and looked at how many five stars I gave out. And a lot, I only gave out like six five stars, which, yeah, okay, that makes sense why I'm not feeling like I'm loving everything. Because it's just, that's so low for me. I, it, it's, it's, I don't tend to give out a ton of five stars, but six is still pretty low for what I do. Um, and then interestingly, there, like, I don't think this has ever come up, but there were actually two books this year that I just declined to rate them at all because they were so badly not for me. One of them was um, my older child's pick and the other, and it was a book that was like a middle grade book that I couldn't see it from that perspective. I really couldn't get out of my parent perspective. And so I was just like, this is so not for me and I can't quite get to that mindset so I don't it doesn't feel fair to rate it but then the other one was one I picked out for myself and it was just uh not exactly what I expected and didn't really have the baseline knowledge I needed to properly be able to understand what was being talked about but I thought it was very interesting that there were two books that were like that I just didn't even feel comfortable rating because that's I don't think again I don't think that's ever happened to me before now, pages. Let's talk pages. I read 35,215 pages, which averages out to 296 pages per book. And that is like just the books that I actually read. It doesn't include anything from the books that I DNF'd. 296. So like that's low. <laughs> <laughs> Even by my standards, that's a little bit low. Um, so I looked at it and um, I read 58 things that were under 300 pages. I was just like, oh, that's why. 
<laughs> now there were a number of manga and comic books and graphic novels in there but honestly there were also I read a surprising number of novellas this year and just like shorter novels um but honestly even more interesting than the fact that I read so many short things is that I actually read seven books that were over 500 pages so I I don't read tomes. They're not my happy place for the most part. I will read them every once in a while because some of the stories are still very worthwhile and I enjoy them, but I always do struggle to get through them and it feels like <laughs> I have spent so much energy reading them. Um, but I read seven of them this year. Now, to be fair, four of them were the Inheritance Cycle series by Christopher Paolini and that my older child picked out for me, but I still read three on my own, which again, feels like a lot. <laughs> but two of them were in the Expanse series, which is a series that is generally just all over 500 pages and one that I am actually enjoying. Um, and then the last one was Foundry Side by Robert Jackson Bennett. Um, I also worked really, really hard on um, completing out series this year. Mostly because, again, a lot of these series had been sitting on my shelf for a really, really long time. I had been in the middle of them for a really long time. And so I focused pretty heavily on getting through those series and managed to complete out six of them. And I decided to DNF like 10 of them, which also is not surprising because I'd been in the middle of them for so long that I just no longer cared about it. And frank frankly, a lot of them just weren't to my taste anymore. So yeah, six completed and 10 DNF'd. That does mean that I'm in the middle of eight, eight of the series. And I think those are the ones that I still need to work to get caught up on. And then additionally, I think I have like five more series that I am currently up to date on. So 13 total, which is honestly not that bad. I am so much happier with this. So honestly, what this tells me is that this year was really the year of a lot of easy breezy reads. Things that weren't necessarily going to be terribly mentally taxing, which honestly in the year 2021 makes a ton of sense. But unfortunately because of that, I didn't find a ton of things that I truly loved. I enjoyed my time well enough, but there weren't a ton of standouts. And I find that's, that's just unfortunate to me. So I think that that's exactly what that, what 2021 needed to be. And I'm really hoping that in 2022, I can focus a little bit more on branching out and finding things that maybe are a little different and that I do end up loving. Here's hoping at least. Um, let's see. So getting into are superlatives. Uh, the worst books of the year. And I have five of them to talk about. Um, actually, in all of these categories, I will not be giving descriptions of the books. And I'm going to keep it pretty brief why I put it into that category. Otherwise, we will be here forever. But I have five books in the worst category. And the first one is Midnight Library by Matt Haig. And I didn't even finish this book. <laughs> But this is a book that um, took me by surprise because our main character does attempt suicide and I, I, it's unclear whether she's successful or not. And she does that within like the first 25 pages. She is clearly depressed, suicidal thoughts, clearly to the point of attempting to do so, um, which was surprising to me because nobody, a lot... A lot of people fail to mention this, but also it was pretty clear from the writing on the wall and then later when I was confirmed when I looked up reviews that this um, book was definitely angling for a <sighs> depression can be cured if you just adjust your thoughts. And that's incorrect. I mean, it is. it can be part of your treatment plan therapy works, um, but it can't cure a chemical imbalance. And so I don't, I think that's a terrible message to be putting out in the world. And so apart from everything else, this kind of made me hate the book. Um, the next one I wanted to mention is You Deserve Each Other by Sarah Hogel. This is an adult romance and it's supposed to be enemies to lovers, except our main characters are bitter, 
and resentful towards each other. And I was so surprised because I was just like, I don't see, like, there is no way for you to get these characters to a place where I can even believe that they are back in love. It's, it's, they used to love each other. So it's like, I can't imagine that they would ever be back in love. And like, there was very few reviews that even mention this. And I was so surprised and it just made me hate this book so much. I was mad. I didn't even finish this, but I was mad when I DNF'd it. And then we have Instant Attraction by Jill Shalvos. And this didn't make me mad. It was just like, I re this is a reread for this year. And honestly, it did not age well. I think it was like published in maybe two 2014, but it was like, it feels like a 2014 book in like the worst way. And definitely also written for a very specific demographic. And it just, it just did not age well. It was just, it was not good. It was not a good romance. I can't recommend it. And then we have Mapping the Interior by Stephen Graham Jones. And this is um, an adult horror novella. And I really should have noped out of this once I realized that our main character was much younger than the back of the book said they were going to be. So the back of the book said, I think, 15. And this kid was like, 10 or 12 or something and I don't generally like books with characters that young but I did continue to read it and then I hated the I hated the ending the ending actually made me angry um because it felt like it did some things that negated the entire rest of the novella it was I I didn't understand it and I hated it it was not a good book and then lastly we have Snapshot by Brandon Sanderson and this is not this is, this is, I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed. Like It's not a good book. So my problem with Brandon Sanderson, with this specific novella from Brandon Sanderson, is the same that I have continued to have, the problems I continue to have with Brandon Sanderson, in that his characters are not well written. His, his world building is interesting, but he info dumps in such clunky ways. And the plot, while at the end, is incredibly interesting. Getting there is so boring because there's just nothing to hold on to. And so this was only like a hundred pages and I actively thought about DNFing it in the middle, which is bad. <laughs> so yes, not good. So those are the worst books that I read this year. So moving into disappointments and we're gonna start with the two books that were disappointments because I hyped them up in my head far too much. And the first is the Archie comics by Mark Wade. So this um, run from Mark Wade, I don't know how many issues it was, but it was six volumes. And it's basically a reimagining of the Archie comics. It's like a, a, an update to them. And I, the first was so strong. It was so clear that um, the writer and the illustrator knew what made the Archie comics good and kept that essence, but just modernized it in a very compelling kind of way. And then every <laughs> volume after that just got steadily worse. And it ended in a way that I thought was fairly mediocre. So it was just kind of disappointing overall, but it was kind of also disappointing because I kept thinking every volume, I kept thinking it's going to get better. And then it just it just didn't. I really wanted this to be so much better than it was. And then we have Devil in the Device by Laura Beth Johnson. And this was just wholly disappointing because the, this was the second book in a duology. And it just, it felt like the author didn't really understand the conventions of how you tell a story as a duology. And so when we got into the second book, the first half was incredibly slow. Um, very clearly like uh, building up what we were going to need in the second half, but that's not generally how you write a duology. And so it, it just didn't feel good. And then of course there was world building that was in contradiction with like previous world building. It just, it was so disappointing because I really enjoyed the first one and this one just, it did not live up to what it could have and then we have the four books 
that um, everybody else hyped up and I do not agree with that assessment. And the first is actually The House in the Cerulean Sea by TJ Klune. Now, I wanted to love this book as much as everybody else and I just didn't. Even when I first read it, I was like, I don't love this as much as everybody. And having about a year's distance from when I read it, like I don't even like it as much as I did as much as I liked it then. I it's not even a bad book. It just I think that there was a lot of a lot of people really liked that it did a lot of different small things, but to me it really bothered me that we were picking up these storylines and not going in depth in them, not doing a ton with it. I kind of would have preferred just sticking with one thing like the romance or helping the kids or whatever it was and really running with it. And that's just not what we got. So I just found this to be really disappointing. And then we have Foundry Side by Robert Jackson Bennett. And honestly, a lot of people were like, oh, this is really interesting. It's fast paced. It's so fun. It's so good. And like, it is fast paced and it is, it's an interesting system, but ugh, the explanations are a little... Um, but the biggest disappointment was we had so many action scenes, but as soon as you pulled back to figure out what was, how it was progressing the plot, it was like, oh, it's not. And then the last like quarter of the book, we got all the plot, all the plot, all the time. And it was just like so overwhelming and I couldn't even keep up with it. It was so much. So this is just, I think a very poorly written book and I was so excited to get into it. <laughs> because so many people had really loved it. And then we have The Unhoneymooners by Christina Lauren. And I tried. I read a hundred pages of this before I called it quits. But honestly, I don't know what everybody sees in it. I think that the writing is terrible. I think that the characters are basically just lumps that move through space. And all of these characters are being put into completely over the top ridiculous situations that they then make worse by how they react to it. And so I made it a hundred pages and I just, I couldn't anymore. Um, it wasn't completely terrible, which is why it's not one of the worst books, but it was really disappointing because I was expecting to not necessarily love it, but at least enjoy my time with it. And I really just did it. Similarly, <laughs> uh, my last disappointment is The Love Hypothesis by Allie Hazelwood. And this was interesting because I knew from like the first chapter that this was not going to work out. And I wasn't wrong. I thought the writing was terrible. And I thought the characterizations were also terrible. And just generally like this whole situation was kind of a mess and I didn't really care. But so many people have loved the love hypothesis that it felt, it, I felt like, again, maybe I'm not going to love this, but I should at least enjoy my time with it. And again, I really just didn't. So moving into the surprises, I do have seven of them. And the first one is actually The Throne of Glass by Sarah J. Maas. I'm not, look, I'm not going to sit here and say that this is amazing, but this has gotten trashed on so, so much. But I think that if you go in with fairly low expectations, with the understanding that this is not going to be like, you know, the literature equivalent in fantasy, but just go to have a good time, know that you're going to have to suspend disbelief, not poke too hard at anything. I think that it is an incredibly fun book. It promises you a fun time. And if you are able to suspend disbelief, you're going to have a fun time. And that's, I, I really did enjoy rereading this. And then actually we have Girl of Fire and Thorns by Ray Carson. This was such a surprise because when I originally read this, I loved it. But going back and rereading a lot of young adult books, I have not enjoyed them as much. So I was a little scared to go back and reread this one, but I was so surprised that it held up so well. I really loved reading this book. It was so good and it just made me happy. So that was a huge surprise. And likewise, in the similar series, is The Empire of Dreams by Ray Carson. So this is 
the fourth book in the series that came out like 10 years, I don't know, after the end of this trilogy. And we've had that happen a lot in recent years. And a lot of them have been really bad. So I went into this thinking, oh, no, well, we'll just see. We'll just see. Maybe it'll be good. Hopefully it'll be good. And I really enjoyed it. Uh, it helped that we were following different characters. And it helped that this story definitely had something different to say than the original trilogy. And we were able to get some look at the characters as they are now, but it really didn't focus on the characters from the previous trilogy. And I think that was really, really smart on the author's part. And I ended up really enjoying this one far more than I really expected to. Another surprise is Supergirl being super by Mariko Tamaki and Joelle Jones, illustrated by Joelle Jones. So this is a, I think, four issue run that's basically just an origin story for Supergirl. And I was very pleasantly surprised at how good this storyline was. I did have a few nitpicky things about it that I was just like, eh, it could have been better. But honestly, I just think it was so solid and honestly a lot better than most of the origin stories that I read. And then we have Unity by Ellie Banks. And this is a surprise because I did not know what to expect going into this. I did just like randomly pick it up from my library. It was like on a display and I was like, sure, I'll read that. And then I did. And so <laughs> I actually really liked this. There it's a debut novel and there definitely is some debut novel issues with it, but overall the ideas are really interesting and I really, I still like think about some of the stuff in this book. I just, I was really pleasantly surprised at how well this worked out for me. And then we have Strange Love by Anna Geary and <laughs> like, I really did not expect to love this because it is like an alien accidentally kidnaps a human kind of situation. And I was just like, I don't know. I don't know about this. I'll give it a shot. And it was a surprisingly sweet romance that had some of the best communication that I've honestly seen in romance in a long time. But more than that, what I found that I really liked about it and is helping me figure out what kind of romances I like is that I really appreciated that this couple kind of came together fairly quickly, actually. Not necessarily like in love very quickly, but supportive of each other very quickly. And it was much more of a story where it's them as a couple against external factors. And I find that I really like that kind of romance. And that's actually a surprise to me. I didn't know that about myself. So in addition to being just a surprisingly sweet romance, it also helped me figure out some of the things that I like in my romances. And then additionally, we have Teach Me by Olivia Dade, which is another adult romance. And this is a romance between older characters. They're both in their 40s. And I surprisingly loved their very quiet, very mature love. They are, it was just so surprisingly pleasant because you just don't get a ton of like older characters falling in love and they tend to be younger characters who are very passionate and make mistakes and it's not like they're making mistakes they're not making mistakes they are they're just different ones that are much more understandable when you're a little bit older and again I just I said it was it surprised me how much I appreciated that aspect of this romance and then we are going to get into the best books of the year. And um, we have eight books to talk about. So first and foremost, um, I, none of these have been in any particular order other than like mostly the order that I read them through the year. Just a heads up. But one of my favorite books this year was Across the Green Grass Fields by Shauna McGuire, the sixth book in the Wayward Children series. This was the warm hug that I wanted House in the Cerulean Sea to be. So this follows a girl that is intersex and she finds her portal, her door, right about the time that it's going, it's becoming very clear that she's not going to have a quote unquote normal puberty, that basically her body isn't processing the hormones or creating the hormones or whatever that is going to give her the, a 
norm again quote unquote normal puberty and she goes through her door to this horse world and like they're like oh she's human but they don't really understand like how humans generally develop so they're like yeah you seem good (laughs) and she is able to have her puberty away from a society that would absolutely scrutinize her and make her feel less than and I absolutely adored that for this book the next book on my list is Empress of Salt and Fortune by Neve Vo, which is a fantasy novella and I like I don't tend to think about books a lot after I finish them this one I kept coming back to throughout the year because I just kept thinking that was so well written it's an epic fantasy in miniature and it is absolutely masterful how Nevo managed to pull that off in this book. I, it's just, it is so, so good. I highly recommend this book. And then we also have um, Library Wars volume 15 by Kiro Yumi. This is the only book that I don't own, but essentially this this manga series, Library Wars, is 15 volumes long. So this is the last volume. And the series, I mean, how it starts out is okay, but it gets better as it goes along. And this last volume is absolutely the best way that this series could have ended. It is just everything the reader kind of wants it to be. It is just so absolutely perfect. And I just loved it so much. Um, And then we have Girl of Fire and Thorns by Ray Carson. Yes, it is making a reappearance on this list. Um, as It's both a surprise and one of my favorite books. It was so good. I would highly recommend this. It stands up. And also, honestly, it still, to this day, feels so just slightly different than any of the other YA fantasy I have ever read. And then we have Gilded Wolves by Roshni Chakshi. So this is such an interesting book. It, it's a historical fantasy and it has this really interesting world building. I have some problems with the magic system, but the world, other world building, at least in this book, is really interesting. But this book is one of my favorites because of how it made me care for all the characters. I absolutely adored some of these characters from book one. It was just honestly fantastic. Um, I didn't necessarily love all the characters, but the ones that I did love, I love a lot, a lot, a lot. So um, yes, this is just, it is a really good book in general. And I absolutely adore the characters. And then next up we have This Is How You Lose a Time War by Amal, um, Amal El Mohar and Max Gladstone. And this is an adult romance. And I did not, act, this is a reread, but I did not actually read the physical copy this time. I listened to the audio. And the audio, this feels like a book that was absolutely meant to be listened to. It gave so much depth to these letters between these women and it was, their emotions were so poignant. It was just, it was absolutely wonderful. And then we have Blood Air by Alona Andrews. And honestly, this book is 100% a love letter to every fan of the Kate Daniels series. This is a, technically a spinoff of the Kate Daniels series. We're following a different character, like Eight Years in the Future. And it really felt like the um, the author duo that is Alona Andrews kind of sat down and were just like, what would make the fans happy? And then they put it all in this book. And it was just like, it's not going to be good if you haven't read the Kate Daniels series. But if you have, again, it's a love letter to us. And then my last um, best book of the year is Written and Read by Anne Bishop. This is another reread, um, and it's one of my favorite books of all time. And I, and this one, 
I, I feel, I still feel comfortable putting this on the list, even though like maybe I shouldn't because it's all, it's already one of my favorite books, but I read this at a time where I really, really needed this book and I, I really needed something that felt like home. And so this absolutely did it for me this year. And like always, I really enjoyed my time with it. So that is it. That is my reading, all of my reading for this year. It just, it feels like a lot of people this year in 2021 really read more or less as much as they normally do, but didn't necessarily feel like they read as much or, and, or felt like they didn't read as many things that they love. And honestly, I'm no exception. And it kind of feels like maybe it's because we're living through a massively traumatic event. But, you know, we can hope that this year will be better and um, we'll just kind of see how it goes. And honestly, even still, I still found th new things to love and I am really, really happy about that. But that is it for this video. So if you have any thoughts or feelings about anything that I talked about, or if you want to let me know some of your best, worst disappointing or surprising books, leave me a comment down below. Like this video if you liked it, subscribe if you want to, and until next time, have happy reading and I will see you in my next video. Bye!